Greetings, everyone that's joining us live. We want to welcome you as we study God's Word together today. We're in Hebrews chapter 11, and I'm Pastor Izzy from Kona, Hawaii. If you want to bring over my beautiful grandson, I just got a motion that he's here to say hello to you all in his fancy little outfit. Probably you will only wear it once because he's growing so fast. He gets to wear them one time. Say, hey, good morning. Hi, everyone. Ready for the Word? Tell him, Theo. Hey, anyway, Theo. Theo's ready. He is ready for his nap. <laughs> He's ready for his nap. <laughs> anyway, we're ready for the Word. So we want you to grab your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Last week we went through verse 21, and we actually backtracked to the book of Genesis to find the backstory to this verse where it said, By faith, Jacob, as he was dying, he blessed each of his uh, son, the sons of Joseph. And remember, that's Manasseh and Ephraim that he blessed. And he worshipped, leaning upon his his staff the top of his staff and so we went into detail how that was the the one mention of of Jacob I mean if you could pick up something to mention of him this is the guy who wrestled the angel and had his name changed to Israel he became the father of the 12 tribes of Israel and yet the only thing we get mentioned about him is that when he was dying he blesses Joseph's sons Manasseh and Ephraim and he worships the Lord I mean, if your life was summed up at the end and they said, give the big highlight for the Hall of Faith, we're going to put you in Hebrews 11, what, what would you want to go down with as the, you know, the memoir of your life that they would, that they would pass on to others to, to be an example of faith? Now, it's interesting because that, that example we went into detail last week. You can look on it live stream on our Facebook wall there at Amazing Grace Ministries International and you can... You can look down and see that sermon, but there's a big significance because Joseph was um, not per se included in the settling of the land of, of Canaan's land some, what, 400 years later when they go into the land, they, um, they take the land and, and Joseph's name isn't on one of the territories, but his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, both are. And so this is a big deal to the Jewish people. Because, you know, this is their heritage. This is how each tribe came to settle into the promised land. And that promise was made, first of all, back to Abraham. Okay? Abraham had Isaac. And I just want you to put together the relationship to, to Jacob here, or also, also known as Israel. Some people get confused because they read the verses and they're like, but it said Jacob. And then, like two verses later, it said Israel. Is it two different guys? No, it's the same guy. Remember? His name was Jacob. He heel catcher he wrestled with the angel and the lord said uh, he said bless me and the lord said i'm not gonna no longer you're gonna be called heel catcher or in hebrew that's kind of like a slang for dirty sneaky thief so sorry if you're named jacob but in in he, hebrew it it got a kind of bad rap well think about how jacob was always working an angle and and doing all those things trying to you know i don't know connive he, he stole his brother's birthright his blessing you know he dressed up under mom's you know direction all we saw all the stuff he did and and none of that gets mentioned in the hall of faith but what does get mentioned is that he blessed joseph's two boys when he was down in egypt now he had been brought down to egypt because of that great famine that was in the land and, and it was in through all the nations around and it was so severe remember how many years did that famine last seven seven and then the seven years of plenty that followed. And by then, Joseph had already been in the land some 22 years. And uh, he had been enslaved to Potiphar and, and then um, put in jail and, and uh, ran the jail for some time and then released and became the right hand of Pharaoh. And we went over all those details. And the reason I'm bringing this out today is because he's the next guy that's going to get mentioned in verse 22 this morning. And we kind of surveyed about 15 chapters of Genesis last week. This week, we're only going to do the last chapter, chapter 50. The author of Hebrews, really, if you're, if you're not aware of it, he's actually highlighting the great patriarchs of the faith in the Jewish culture, and he's skimming through the highlights of the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Hebrew writing of the Pentateuch. There's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. And who was the guy who wrote all those books? Do you guys know who penned those books out? Moses. Moses. By the way, we'll get to him next week. Okay, because he's coming up. But this week, we're, we're in that, that very last chapter of the book of Genesis. And we read here that Joseph, 
the son of Israel, of one of the twelve, is going to be mentioned here. And let's see what he's mentioned for. It says, By faith Joseph, when he was dying, verse 22, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel, and he gave orders concerning his bones. I remember last week we went over um, the orders that his dad gave to him. Jacob, or Israel, called Joseph to him, and he had been there in the land of Egypt because Joseph rescued him, basically, and his whole family. He said, go get dad, bring everybody, come down to Egypt. We, I'll take care of you. I'll make sure you guys are taken care of. They gave him the best land of Goshen because they were, they were sheep herders. They, they gave him the, the pasture land there, the, the choicest pasture land in Egypt. And how many folks came down with, uh, with uh, Jacob, do you remember? We went over this last week. 70 persons in all. And um, these guys are come into the land, you know. Uh, and then not, it says excluding Joseph and his two sons. And they were already there. And so they come down to Egypt. And, and his dad said, listen, son, swear to me. And we went over this last week. He made him put his hand on his thigh and said, you swear to me that when I die, you won't leave me here in this land. And he told him something. He said, take me back to the promised land. And bury me with, with who, who do you want to be buried with? you remember? Rachel. His wife, Rachel. He had purchased a, a plot there for uh, going, ascending up there toward Bethlehem. He said, bring me back there and bury me next to her. And so Joseph swore he would do it. We saw last week he did at the end of, at the end of Jacob's life when he, when, after he blessed his sons, he dies. And Joseph honors it. He has him, he has him you know, by the Egyptian way, he has him um, embalmed gets him all prepared, has this long period of mourning, brings him back to, to the tomb there in Canaan. He tells Pharaoh, look, I promised my dad I would bring him back to be buried by his wife. And Pharaoh goes, whatever you need, Joseph, take it. And so they take a whole procession, mourners, everybody. They all go back and they bury Jacob. But I want you to know something, that Jacob, Jacob said, take me back to the land which was promised to my forefather, and how, how much forefather was the guy who was promised? Abraham. How far removed is Abraham from Jacob? His grandfather. He's his grandfather. <laughs> yeah, it's not far at all. As a matter of fact, yeah, Jacob is um, his. Now, this is an interesting thing because Abraham had the Lord appear to him in Genesis and say, look at the stars. You're going to have descendants as numerous as these stars. And it says, and Abraham believed God. And then he went on and told him some other things. He said, that he was going to take him and he was going to bring him, um, bless him in this land, and he was going to he was going to be in this land in Genesis. We're, we're told, and the Lord was going to cause him to be prospered in the land. That his descendants were going to be numerous, like the sand of the seashore, the stars of the heaven. And then he he tells him that they will also, after they've been in the land, they're going to also come into captivity into the land of Egypt for 400 years. Now this is told to Abraham way ahead of time. Before it ever happened, the Lord prophesied and told him, look, you're gonna have great descendants, they're gonna multiply, but they're gonna wind up being in bondage for 400 years. And after they're in bondage for 400 years, he says, I'm gonna bring you back from that land, those that oppress you. If you wanna know where this is, this is Genesis chapter 15. I don't want you to think I'm making up this story. Some people look at me like, you know, where do you get all this stuff, Pastor? I'm like really big on reading the book and uh, I have photographic memory so I, I tend to sometimes not um, always turn the page, I just am reading out of my head for you, but I'm doing it as fast as I can. I'm trying to squeeze this in 20 minutes. This is, I'm gonna cover a, long, a lot of history here to, to compress it, but let me show you in Genesis 15, when this is where the Lord took him out in verse five and showed him the stars and, and, and said, count them. And he said, if you're able to, and he said, so shall your descendants be. Genesis 15, six says, and then he believed the Lord, and he, the Lord, reckoned it to him as righteousness. God said, you are in right, righteousness, not self-righteousness. You are in right standing with me. God says, that's what true righteousness is, is to be right with God. He was in right standing with God because it says that he believed what God said. God said, this is going to be so. He said, well, you say so, I believe you. Well, if all, that's how simple it is, but... How, how difficult we make it sometimes when the Lord tells us something. We're like, yeah, I know the Lord says, if I just put my faith in Jesus, I shall be saved. But, uh, you know, sometimes, anyone here ever have a, a day of waver? 
you know, your 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 faith meter's a little bit, you know, not maybe steady on high. It's like, and 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 you're going, well, you want to be right with God. He said this. I didn't say this. The, the scripture says, if any man calls upon the name of the Lord, they what? They might be saved. The needle might wait. You may may no. It says, if any man calls upon the name of the Lord, he what? Shall be saved. You will be saved if you call upon the Lord. And here, Abraham is called the great father of the faith simply because God spoke something to him and he goes, well, if you say it, I believe you. That's it. You Okay. Works for me. And God, God reckons that as putting you in the right standing, righteousness before God. You are in right standing with God when you believe what he says. That's really hard because in these days, there's a lot of folks coming against us saying, you don't really believe what God says. You don't really think the Bible teaches this stuff to tell us what God says. I'm like, yeah, I do. I remember in Sunday school, they used to tell us the B-I-B-L-E was the um, the Bible. That's a book for me. And it um, and, and it was, I, it's funny because one of the teachers said, the Bible is basic, B, basic instructions, I, before, B, leaving, L, and what's the last one? Earth. Basic instructions before leaving earth. That's what the Bible is. Just to teach you what you need to know to get you ready to go. And so here we have God's word pointing out to us that he can make a promise and he knows, he knows the beginning from the end. This is, by the way, one of the greatest faith building things that you can gather from today's study is that he knew this all ahead of time. And if you read on, in Genesis 15, God said then to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will enslave you and oppress you 400 years. But I also will judge the nation whom they serve, and afterwards they will come out with many possessions. And as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. And the f then in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. So the Lord spoke to him that this was going to happen. If you read on, it says it tells you they're going to go down to Egypt, and that's where they're going to be enslaved. And this is before... Now, this is told to Abraham. Does Abraham wind up in Egypt? No, no he dies a good old age, 175 years. He's, he dies, and um, he didn't go to Egypt. But Isaac, his son, he's, he's heard the story, I'm sure, from Dad. And Jacob... Isaac's son also gets to hear, you know, maybe he tells, hey, my dad was told hey, he's going to have descendants like the stars and we're going to wind up enslaved, but we're going to come back. And the reason I, I point this out to you is just so you know, Jacob was actually alive long enough to hear the story firsthand from his grandpa, Abraham. He didn't have to hear it from Isaac, his dad. He could have just been sitting around with grandpa. Grandpa told me that God showed him the stars and said, count them and you know, have you ever sat around with your grandparents and your, your grandpa's telling you a story? I mean, I had that privilege of getting to have my grandpa tell me stories. And he would always repeat the story about how he came over to, to, the, to, to America from, from Sicily with a fig tree cutting in his pocket and planting that. You know, he'd tell me the story over and over. I knew the story. I believe Jacob knew the story so well that, well, I don't know when he passed it on to his son, to Joseph, but I believe that he did. Now remember, he had Joseph as his boy before his brothers threw him in that pit and then sold him off into slavery. How old was Joseph when that happened? We went over this last week. 19? 17. 17. 17 years old. So he could have heard this story from his dad in the first 17 years of his life. Or he's going to have a 22-year gap between being around dad, you know, for all those years he spends in Egypt and so he's finally raised up and the brothers finally come for some food. But then when he does bring dad down to Egypt, Isaac is 130 years old. And he's going to live in, in the land of Egypt till he's 147. Another 17 year period that Isaac gets, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I said Isaac, I meant Jacob. That Jacob gets brought down, Israel gets brought down to Egypt. And now he can tell his son, hey, my my grandpa, Abraham, said we were going to be enslaved in this land. He said it to me. I remember him telling the story for 400 years. But God was going to judge the nation that oppresses us and bring us out of this land back to the promised land. 
Now, either he told Joseph this story in the first 17 years of his life, or he waited until he was a little older and he had another 17-year window that he could have told him later when he was down there in Egypt. But how many of you think he might have done it both? I mean, kind of a big story because it, it's, it's actually repeated in Scripture. And, and I know that it's um, something that sunk into Joseph so much so that, well, the Bible in, in he, Hebrews 11 says that upon his deathbed, Joseph mentions Israel's exodus. Now, what does he mention? It doesn't say here, but if you're a Jewish person, you, they already know these stories. So this is just for our sake. Let me turn with you to Genesis chapter 50, and let's see. We only get, <laughs> guys, you're going to love it today. I only got five verses to com complete the end of the, uh, of the book of Genesis with you here. Mm -hmm. Where Joseph is on his deathbed. But, um, oh, let me just throw this one little detail in that his brothers pulled off. After dad died, and they did the whole funeral procession back to Canaan's land. And when they're coming back, it says in verse 12, that thus he he did, um, his sons did for him as he had charged them. You know, they, they went and buried dad. And his sons carried him to the land of Canaan, buried him there in the cave, in the field of Machpelah, before Mamre, which Abraham had bought, it says, along with the field for the burial site from Ephraim the Hittite. After he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt. Verse 14 says, he and his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. And verse 15 says, and when Joseph's brothers saw that his father was dead, they said, what if Joseph should bear a grudge against us and pay us back in full for all the wrong which we, had th we, we did to him? So they sent a message to Joseph and said, um, Joseph, your father charged be, uh, before he died, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, Please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sins, for they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of God, of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. And his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. And Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for I am in God's place. As for you, he said, now they're, they're actually putting words, I believe, in a dead man's mouth here. You, you kind of get that? They're going, um, oh, by the way, Joseph, dad said before he died, don't be mad with us. Please don't take it out on us. You know, they're, they're worried because he could. I mean, he is the right hand man of the, the king of the Pharaoh of Egypt. He could have, he could have really had his way with, the, with his brothers for what they did to him. But he, he says, don't worry about it, guys. Now, this is, this is a maturity that is something that I believe we grow into in the New Testament um, as we grow as Christians. And I think Joseph is a great Old Testament example of this truth. Look what he says. He says, as for, he says to them, don't be afraid, for I am in God's place. In Hebrew, for in what? For am I in God's place? For, uh, I'm sorry. For am I in God's place? He says, as for me, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and for your little ones. And so he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. You, you guys meant this for evil to me, he says. But what does he point out? God meant it for good. Even the evil which was brought against Joseph by his own brothers, he had the the ability to see the bigger picture. If I wouldn't have been sent down here ahead of you, he saw it was God. And he said this to him when he revealed himself to them earlier in the book of Genesis. He said, God sent me ahead of you to preserve our family. You, you, you know, and now he's just reiterating. You guys meant it for evil against me, but God worked it for good for the salvation of our whole, our whole father's name is preserved because God worked it for good. This is this is the New Testament teaches what is it Romans um, in, in Romans eight twenty eight that God causes how many things to work together for the good of those that what all, love Him. All. All, 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 most things, some some things. I heard some of your theology. That's why I'm saying this. I'm just joking. <laughs> I, I mean, I get calls all the time, Pastor. I don't think this works together for good. I'm pretty sure this one's excluded in the all things category. It doesn't. You know, Wally Dolan, my dear, my dear right hand man for many years here. Every time something will go wrong, he go, 
Well, God works most things together for good, you know. <laughs> Can't see how he's going to do this one, you know. And he would always, he would always, when I met him, it was only some things. We, we, it, it, it was a growth process for him. He, he'll he admit it. He, he went from it's some things God has worked together and then to, well, some more things and then most things. And finally, after about 15 years, I think he went, okay, all is all. And, uh. All things together. And this is something that's a real maturity. Joseph is a great example. He saw that God caused this all to work together. Now we only have, what, five more verses of the whole book of Genesis left to us? And look what it says. It says, Now Joseph stayed in Egypt and his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. And Joseph saw the third generation of Ephraim's sons, and the sons of Machar and the sons of Manasseh were born on Joseph's knees. So him is the first generation. And how many generations did he see? Three. Three. And what did it say in Genesis 15? And how many generations will pass until the Lord brings them out? It said it right there. Did you notice it? Four generations. Joseph. And he sees three more generations. Four generations would pass that they would be in Egypt. And he says, and Joseph sees this. The, the, these guys are being born and Joseph says to his brothers I'm about to die but God will surely take you and bring you up from this land which he promised on oath to Abraham to Isaac and to who? his own dad Jacob or also known as Israel and then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear saying God will surely take you uh, uh, take care of you and you shall carry my bones up from here so Joseph died at the age of 110 years. He was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. That's the end of the book of Genesis right there. Joseph dies, put in a coffin, and he gave them the charge, you got to take me out of here when you go. But it, the, the, the book ends right there. It's like, it doesn't say they took him out. Nothing, just end of Genesis. Joseph dead in a coffin in Egypt. Okay, except the author of Hebrews says he spoke by faith. Rumbling uh, moment on my as well things. The outdoor living of Hawaii get all the motorcycle noises too. So he he speaks and he says here the author of Hebrews says by faith when he was dying he made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel and he gave orders concerning he by faith knew God was going to let them leave this land. Yet it wasn't going to happen right away. You guys know the story, right? Well, let, let me just show you. The book of the very next book of your Bible, Exodus, in my Bible is kind of cool because um, my Bible ends Genesis right here and Exodus starts like right there. So they're on the same page, you know, end of Genesis here, beginning of Exodus right here. And um, it just continues the story. The, the problem is, um, well, let me just show you the problem when I read it. I, I, I'll, you might pick up on it, but... I'm just reading along. Joseph dies. They put him in the tomb. And I read into the next very part of the Bible. I don't know. The very next book it says, Now these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob. And they came, each one of them, uh, with his household. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulon, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. Bless you. And it says, And all these persons who came from the loins of Jacob were seventy in number. But Joseph was already in Egypt. Well, we, were, we read that in Genesis already, right? And it says, Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. And the sons of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly and multiplied and became exceedingly mighty so that the land was filled with them. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And it says here, and, and he said to his people, behold, this people... The sons of Israel are more and mightier than we are. Come, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply in the event of war, and they would join themselves to those that hate us and fight against us and depart from the land. So they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor. And they built for Pharaoh the storage cities, Pithon and, and Ramses. And, but the more they afflicted them, the more, what happened? The more they multiplied. And they spread out so that they were in dread of the sons of Israel. And the Egyptians compelled the sons of Israel to labor vigorously. And they made their lives bitter with hard labor and mortar and bricks and all kinds of labor in the field. And their labors were rigorously imposed on them. So this, 
Then the kings uh, uh, of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, and one whose name was Shifra, and the other was Pua, and, and he said, When you're helping the Hebrew women to give birth, and you see them upon the birthing stool, if it is a son, then you shall put him to death. But if it's a daughter, then she shall live. They didn't want any more Hebrew men to be multiplying in the land. He's like, you, you know, you midwives some, get rid of the baby boys. He thought this, you know, this is the midwives that says feared God. And they didn't do as the king commanded them, but they let the boys live. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and let the boys live? And the midwives, they told Pharaoh, Well, it's because um, the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They're vigorous. And when they give birth, before the midwife can get to them, well, they're already done. And um, so it says God actually was good to the midwives. And the people multiplied and became very mighty. And it came about that the midwives feared God, and he established households for them. And then Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born to you, you are to cast into the Nile. Every daughter you are to keep alive. This is where stuff really gets bad. And then a young Hebrew boy is born, and his name is what? Well, he's got an Egyptian name, Moses. You guys, the very next chapter is the birth of Moses. And... So here's my problem. I'm reading this along and I I don't really know the timeline of the whole thing. When Genesis ends and Joseph dies and, you know, how long until, um, well, he's forgotten by the new king. And my son was asking, how could you forget Joseph? I mean, he was like a big deal. But see, it's funny how people can't even tell us, like, who was the president before Obama? You know, I mean, if I just go back one or two, not not even ten years, people, they, I don't know, I'm not sure, you know, and I'm like, it's really easy for them to forget Joseph after he dies. Just give it a little time, have maybe a new king arise, he's a young boy when he comes into his kingdom, and he doesn't know who the old guys were that were running the kingdom ten years before. Ten years to him is a lifetime, you know, or twenty years ago, maybe... And so within a really short period of time, they have forgotten who was this blessing to the whole nation of Egypt that preserved them by God through that great famine, that seven years of famine. And Joseph's forgotten, but the people have multiplied. Now, last week I went over what the big deal is because the very next book after Genesis, Exodus, there's a book called Leviticus and then a book called Numbers. And the book of Numbers tells us that when they came out of the land, uh, they came, I'm sorry, out of Egypt. They were told to number the tribes, except for one tribe. Which tribe did they leave out? Levi. Levi. Couldn't number the priests, the, the, the tribe of the priests. But they were to number the other tribes. And in the numbering, they don't have the tribe of Joseph counted. They had the tribe of Manasseh and Ephraim. So there's still 12 tribes when you count them up. It's just that a name change uh, has occurred. And um, they number them, and there were 603,550 men, the age of war, 20 and up, that came out of Egypt. So they had multiplied. But how much time happened between the end of Genesis, and we jumped to Exodus, and now Moses is born, and they're going to be coming out of Exodus. The book of Exodus is the what? Exodus. The Exodus out of Egypt. Egypt. Who can tell me how many years have passed? Four, there's four, that's right, 400 years of oppression, 430 years, there's a 30 year period, the good part, like that first part where they got brought down by Joseph and, and dad was there and he lived 17 years in the land, there's still 13 more years of prosperity historically, but then comes that new king. So they should have put a little thing between Genesis and Exodus for me. Like right here, at the at that little page, that little gap right here. They should just put 400 year gap. You know, like, I mean, j just yeah. to help my brain. You know, this is not like, sometimes we read, we're reading the Bible and it compresses time. You know, it gives us, the reason it's so good at giving the big picture is because it can compress all this time and bring out really important points. But when the thing is compressed, sometimes we don't take the time to expand and sit back and go, wow, this guy said, when you guys exit, when the exodus happens, God is going to take you out of here. He gets his whole mention of faith, Joseph. He's not mentioned the, the faith that he had that God caused us to work together for good. 
and you know other things that he could have been highlighted for in his life the faith it took to interpret dreams and get it right i mean that i i I would want him to mention that. Hey, I got the dream right, you know, and, <laughs> and, 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 and you know, I mean, wouldn't that be like, hey, by faith, I mean, this, because, you know, it's just a dream, and it wasn't even his dream. No, it was the Pharaoh's dream. Remember the seven fat cows that were swallowed by the seven skinny cows and didn't even look like they ate a cow? I mean, that's weird anyway, a cow eating a cow, but, you know, it wasn't even in Joseph's dream, but he interpreted. Or the baker and the, and the cupbearer, he interpreted their dreams. Now, if you were called upon and someone said, give me the interpretation of this dream by God, wouldn't you want to like, even have an honorable mention that by faith you interpreted that dream? Nope. Not even what the author of Hebrews tells. Now, why am I pointing to You'll see later, when we get through all these examples of faith, if I teach it to you well, I'll be able to show you something that's super cool when you line up all of these highlights. Because they all string together into a master tapestry. A beautiful picture is being painted for our faith. And it's not excluding those stories. It's emphasizing these stories for a reason. Because it's going to paint a beautiful picture in the fabric of faith for us. When you see them all, they, they connect. By the way, it's not like, it, it's like that master weaver that's on the loom and he's passing the string back and forth and pulling the little thing and sliding it through and pulling it forth, right? And at first you're like, it doesn't make sense. You don't see any picture because it's all these different, right? The different thread colors are shooting this way and that way and they're weaving. And Well, let me tell you, the author of Hebrews is a master weaver of, of the story that he's bringing about in this great hall of faith. And every thread he's pushing through is going to, when, when they're all put together and they're all packed down and they're all, you step back and you look at this whole tapestry, you're going to see something really neat that helps, I mean, it helps my faith. But it took me a long time, I was telling my son, it took me a long time to, to learn the names of the guys. Like, I, I was confused at first, why is he Israel one chap, or one verse and two verses later he's Jacob again? And then it, it goes back and forth in Genesis. Did you ever notice that? Like, it, they got an identity crisis on this guy or you know what why did they just pick one name and go with it you know that's my thinking you know it would be easier if i but there's even subtleties to that whole thing if you study that beautiful things that you can glean from god's word when you learn these stories but once you finally get kind of a grip on who's who in the zoo yeah. and what what guy said had god speak what to him and and how Somehow, Abraham had to pass it on to his son Isaac, and Isaac passed it on to Jacob, or forget Isaac in the middle, grandpa just told his grandson, and Jacob told his son, hey son, my grandpa Abraham said God told him we were going to multiply, and we were going to become a multitude in this land. And he was going to judge this land for oppressing us after 400 years and bring us out of this land. And so he, he had to... The exodus of, of Israel from Egypt isn't going to happen for, yeah, like 400 years. And yet on his deathbed, he says, when you guys go, not if you guys go. So what's this tell you about his faith? By faith, he mentions the Exodus and says, don't leave me here. Don't leave my bones here. When you guys go, carry me up out of here and bring me back to the land which God promised to Abraham. And repeated that promise to my, my, my father Isaac. And now I'm telling you the promise so that you will remember, get me out of here. Now that was by faith because he didn't ever live to see it. Sometimes people tell us, things that our forefathers have said in the faith and they did it by faith They're, they told of things that god would do in the future and some people are like how come you believe it i go because i heard from those guys that god promised it to them and he just repeated the promise right even the promise of the messiah didn't he cause that promise to be repeated over and over abraham isaac jacob down to david and he, he continued the repeating of the promise that god was going to redeem but he started the promise right from when Adam and Eve sinned. 
before that. But, yeah. The well, foundation the Bible the says Christ was seen as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Didn't take God by surprise we were going to mess up. He already worked out the answer. So when I tell people about Jesus, why are you so into Jesus? I go, because he worked out the answer for us before the whole thing began. And that gives me great comfort. Because some people think it's like uh, an experiment gone wrong. It's out of control. This whole world. And God doesn't know what's going on. I'm like, he knew what was going on from the beginning. And he's the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end, the scripture says. So don't be afraid. Even when bad stuff happens, maybe you can, well, just look at Joseph's life and go, you know, God had something bigger he was working. And Joseph understood it. This, you guys meant for evil, but God meant for good. Sometimes I have to, I have to kind of settle back in my life and some evil things have happened and I got to go, you know, they meant it for evil. But what did God mean for it? You know, God will work it for good because he's bigger. So that's the thing I wanted to share with you today just to give you a little encouragement for your faith that Joseph is a great example of faith in something that isn't going to happen for hundreds of years. But yet he knows it's going to happen. So he tells them to, to, to be ready. Now, I know something that's going to happen that the scripture says. And it's from, some people ask me, you, you're one of those Christians those, that believes the Bible when it says, um, Jesus will come back, don't you? And I'm like, I'm like, yeah. And they go, well, where do you get that? I mean, what, 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 on what authority? And I, I love that. It's a great question, by the way. If someone asks you that, what's the answer? Jesus. Jesus. Um, Jesus. Yeah. Je <laughs> Jesus said that. <laughs> he said, in my, I'm, don't worry. He said, don't let your heart be troubled in John 14. I go to my father's house to prepare a place for you. And in my father's house are many mansions. And, and he says, if it were not so, I wouldn't tell you. But I go and I'm getting a place ready for you that so that where I am, you may be also. I'm going to go and I'm going to come again, he says, and receive you to myself. Now, I didn't come up with the idea he's coming back. He did. And so people get mad at me. You really believe he's going to come back? I'm like, yeah. Yeah. And he said so. And uh, and I want to encourage you, since he said it, maybe you should be ready. Like, it's okay that if he says, get ready, uh, when, when you see signs of the times that he talks about, wars and rumors of wars and pestilence and famines and earthquakes, he says, what should you do? Look up. Your redemption draweth nigh. Hey, you want to come see me? We're ending this. <laughs> He's, he, he's going, it's time. You're done. You went too long. Yeah. Life's good. So so just know the Lord is coming back. We don't know when, but we know be ready. And yay. He, even Theophilus agrees. Let's get ready. And, uh, and by faith. It's only by faith because I got to hear this. Maybe you haven't heard this yet, but maybe you can read John 14. It's a great thing to encourage your faith. And uh, we want to encourage you in it. Next week, we're going to come back. And guess who's next in the Bible? Moses. Well, we got to him today in Exodus. It's Moses. But Moses gets five verses of Hebrews, not one. So he's kind of a big deal in the book. And the, and the, the threads of the life of Moses that are going to be woven into this picture, they're sweet. So, so if you want to read ahead, just pick up where we did in Exodus and start reading about the life of Moses. And um, you can read, you're going to read a bunch of the book of, Mo of Exodus but the author of Hebrews is going to pick from that, from that book the highlights that you guys will see. So we'll be there next week. Come back, join us. As my wife hates, the same bat time, same bat channel. But, uh, but she didn't watch Batman and Robin like I did when she was little. She's like, what are you talking about? Anyway, we'll be back same time if the Lord wills. If he doesn't come for us before then, we'll see you next week. And we'll be continuing to build you up in the faith. And Theophilus says, later, everyone, come back next week. What are you doing? He's trying to grab my Bible. Wow, he's getting into it. Anyway, aloha, blessings. <laughs>